Okay, and I can hear you, so we're good. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, fair to middling on the phone stuff. So I, so I brought you in there, and we got a little bit of uh, interference on your line, but we can hear you. We can hear you, Aaron. <laughs> So what I wanted to talk to you about, and I have been trying to figure out how to uh, cover this since I first actually heard that this film exists, and then a few weeks later I got a note um, that it was coming to uh, the Twin Ports. Um, but this uh, axe giant Paul Bunyan movie is opening at the um, at the it's opening at the Zinema in downtown Duluth um, tonight. And you've actually seen the movie, and, and I wanted to... Well, actually, why don't you introduce yourself so people can get some context of, you know, who this guy is and all these hats he wears. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Aaron Brown's my name, and I uh, live up... Uh, I'm from the Iron Range, and I live, uh, still live here uh, a little further north, up in the woods north of Nashwalk now. Uh, and I cover, you know, through my writing, the whole of the Iron Range in northern Minnesota. I have a blog, minnesotabrown.com, and I uh, am an author and have uh, uh, regular um, contributions to um, another public station, uh, Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE, which covers a large section of northern Minnesota. And, so and that's Aaron, my, my background's in journalism, and I teach uh, by day. I teach at Hibbing Community College. You're, so if you're in Balsam Township, that's not very far from the KAXE Tower either, is it? No, it, we're just north. It, well, parts of Balsam are just north of Grand Rapids, and, uh, and the part I'm in on the east side is, is more a little closer to Nashwalk. Yeah. So, and that uh, disclosure is uh, where I... One of the places that mentored me into radio and how to do community radio. So, um, and Aaron and I are we're kind of BFFs on Twitter and and uh, <laughs> probably I don't know about if I follow you on Facebook or not, but but on but on Twitter you're uh, you're you're fun on Twitter. Oh, thanks. And yeah. you yeah. And you are kind of a cultural critic, which is why I was glad that you had seen this movie because I've only been able to find time to just watch parts of it, and yeah. uh, but. I, I get I think I get the vibe as it's sort of a horror movie, but it's also kind of a throwback to um like the the drive in days, you know, the B yeah. and, and C grade movies. But there also seems to be like a bit of a love letter to the North Country woven in there. But I mean I didn't see it, so I'm wondering if that yeah. resonates with well, you. My reaction on watching the movie is that it is it is definitely a contemporary throwback to that B movie style. In other words, there's a lot of hokiness in the in the plot on purpose. You know, they 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 seem to have made it so that it's they aren't trying to be like, what if there really was a giant. Uh, a uh, guy in the woods who chopped people up with axes, and well, how would people really react? It's it's almost more like uh, uh, just surrealist kind of um, kind of theater, and uh, it, it, it's it, I would describe the movie as quite fun. Uh, it's it's the kind of movie that if you were a a, a, a young kid at a slumber party, or uh, if you were uh, looking to go have a, a, a a dopey laugh with some friends or uh something uh, on a weekend um, late at night at a at a at a friend's house you want to watch something something fun this would be that kind of movie and you know it's um that's not to say it's definitely a horror movie i mean there's a few spots where something jumps out and and things happen that that are a little scary and you definitely don't want the little kids going to it it's it's definitely a horror movie but it's 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 fun. It's a fun old style horror movie uh, in the style you can almost see it filmed in black and white in some ways, and 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 you can just imagine uh, seeing it on the classic movie channel just just as one of those old throwback movies. Um, that was my impression in, impression of the style of the movie, uh, and it's um, it's definitely uh, it, it's set in northern Minnesota. I don't believe it's filmed in northern minnesota there's a few little continuity problems there's a mountain in the background of a couple of scenes <laughs> i thought it was just, wisconsin 
I thought it was. Yeah, well, it looks like uh, Michigan, Ohio, and then um, out west, a couple places. They filmed it. They did film it in the woods. It's it's not a studio picture. They filmed it in the woods, uh, and that part is real. It's real enough. It's it's. Uh, they got the DNR logo or the uh, the Minnesota. Um, They've got what looked to be real Minnesota signs and 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 things. They they went to that level, so it, it's plausibly Minnesota, but it's it's um, it's definitely set in Minnesota, and uh, it spans um, I don't know a hundred and hundred and thirty year uh, uh, period with some flashbacks to the origins of of you know the quote unquote real Paul Bunyan, uh, and and then it it takes place. Um, in the woods of today, uh, I don't know if you want me to go into the plot. No, well, I know I, I don't want to hear too much about the plot because I think people yeah. are going to either check it out or they're yeah or they're not. But there's uh, but we can we can say one you can set up one thing for me, which is that uh, one. I mean, I really tried hard to watch this with one of my cousins to get it so I could uh-huh. watch it with one of my cousins because we grew up with. Uh, you know, three channels. Well, you grew up in in the. You yeah, probably even you probably just channels. had one or two channels in. Uh, well, in, if we could pick up one of them, but yeah, we we got uh, three or I guess four, uh, depending on the day. And then thirteen. You got thirteen, didn't you? Thirteen was the the, the one that came in good up here. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, Dan Haggerty from Grizzly Adams is actually in the movies. Who who feels like a surrogate uncle to me, just from the seventies and eighties of his uh-huh. his TV shows. And, and Martin Sheen's younger brother. That you've never heard of, really? Um, uh, that that's the the wily guy in the woods. Um, um, what's his name? Um, um, Joe Estevez uh, is Martin Sheen's younger brother, and he actually kind of he, he resembles him quite closely. It's a little that's another surreal <laughs> thing is to have uh, a guy who kind of looks like Martin Sheen, and yeah, uh, Grizzly Adams, and yeah, it's all in there. And so they kind of it either came together by accident, by synchronicity, or by plan. But it has, but it does have like a surreal, fun feel to it. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned your father too. Now, what age of what? Where's the cutoff of your kids? Because I was thinking maybe my ten year old, not the four year old. But but what yeah, do you not, think? Not not the not the not the young elementary kids. Uh, if the kids in in middle school, uh, uh, you know, use your discretion, it probably there's some blood, you know, and there's some. Uh, they, they, okay, no, I don't think this will be a spoiler, but it's it's the premise is Paul Bunyan's is real, and he's a really big kind of a monstery guy who lives in the woods, and he has a giant axe, and sometimes he chops a person up. Okay, so what? Ask yourself. When would you want your kids to see a, a, a pretend monster pretend to chop people up? It's not like super realistic, but it's definitely it's definitely a thing. Yeah. And uh, this is another speaking of surreal. So I want to ask the 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 local historian, regional historian, about yeah. the real what what's the comparison to the real Paul Bunyan, who is himself fictional <laughs> fictional. <laughs> But I mean, yeah. but well, mm-hmm. but I mean, it's logging is a part of our area, and I should say, you know, being Native American owned media, that there's some real tension around how this area was logged, what happened to the land, and um, oh yeah, and you know what was left, you know, the Cloquet fires, you know, being one egregious example of you know some real devastation from how things right. were done. Well, and that's certainly something I've run into. You know, as you know, I'm a radio producer, and I've I've wanted to come in and do, uh, you know, dopey spoofs of the of the Paul Bunyan legend, and especially when we've worked um, with Native people uh, in different shows I've done. It's been a, it's been a source of some tension, and, and and you know, rightly so. There's a history there. Um, this movie takes that that notion of this uh, benevolent giant Paul Bunyan who settled the land for the people. Uh, it definitely turns that into something else entirely. Um, it, the, other than he wears plaid and he was a logger and he is big, uh, this is a very different backstory. It, 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 well, I won't get into how. It, it, there's an origin story, but he's um, he's born uh, a normal to a normal uh, you know human 
uh, 1800s logging family, and, and, and there's just something different about him, as you learn in the movie, and, and he gets to be a very big, um, very angry man because he, you know, he... It, it, it's almost like a King Kong story. Okay. Uh, you know, if you if you watch this movie, it's almost like uh, he's not, you know, he's not fully to blame for what happens, but he he does make uh, what we could call bad choices. <laughs> <laughs> but, There's the dad again. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> but he. He's definitely uh, a figure that's just like, what do you do with this this creature? This well, I shouldn't say a creature because he's presented as a human, but he doesn't act like a human. He, you know, there's there's some things that are different about him, and and so we have, and and then he's wronged in a couple of instances, but then he reacts very violently and then creates. Um, uh, real problems, uh, and this goes back to is the the movie opens on an old logging camp in the late 1800s, and uh, they're um, they're they're all just chatting about logging stuff, and then w- what appears to us to be just a random occurrence, this 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 Paul Bunyan comes out of the woods with an axe and does uh, some horrible things. And uh, we don't know why, and and then we find out why later in the movie. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, as far as the controversy over Paul Bunyan and and how he's perceived, I would say this movie does very little to improve uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Paul Bunyan legend. In fact, if you don't like Paul Bunyan because of what he might represent, you might enjoy this movie just because it definitely takes Paul Bunyan <laughs> down a peg, at least. It throws out that old uh, uh, overwrought uh, cartoon image of Paul Bunyan, and it, it creates a, a bit of a darker edge to it, you know. Um, at one point, you, you get a sense that maybe the film producers are, are uh, um, you know, um, making a commentary on overlogging, but then they kind of move away from that and they make commentaries about other things. But it... it, it it's not a political movie by any means. It's it's um, it's it's just for fun. But but he, he makes quite the uh, imposing uh, antagonist or or uh, whatever of this. You know, like I said, a B movie plot. You know, and um, there are uh, a number of actors in the movie who I didn't necessarily know their names, but you might you might have seen them uh, here and there on various things you've seen, like you mentioned. Uh, Dan Haggerty and, and, of course, Joe Estevez and some of these guys. You, you might have seen them in a couple of other movies that were on cable late at night. You know, they're they're all vaguely familiar. But um, uh, anyway, that's, that's what I guess, all I'd say about the Paul Bunyan angle is it, it definitely is not the typical Paul Bunyan movie. So this is, uh, we're talking about Axe Giant, The Wrath of Paul Bunyan, which uh, has its local pre- premiere tonight in Duluth, and it's going to run for about a week at the Zinema. And then to, to, for tonight's show, um, uh, why did I lose this girl? Summer Summer Hagen uh, is going to be there, and she actually wrote and produced this movie, Lumber Jill. Have you seen Lumber Jill? I haven't. Yeah. No. We're, well, we'll talk about that some other time, or I'll, I'll send you some information about yeah, that. But cool. anyway, Lumber Jill was produced uh, almost entirely here in um, uh, Cloquet, Using a mix of uh, lo- of lots of local talent and a few professional actors like Summer Hagen, who grew up uh, out on in Big Lake and went to Cloquet High School, and and we actually interviewed sure. her. And I'm gonna I'll try and share for everybody uh, that's listening. I'll try and share some, at least a piece of that uh, interview that we did a couple weeks ago with her. So um, now I, I want to I'm we're gonna we're gonna take a leap here. So and the, this is uh, one of the things that that I've been working on, kind of in the background, Aaron over the last few months is how our stories inform our attitudes, uh, you know, contemporary attitudes and also uh, myths and things like legends like Paul Bunyan, how they're used to, uh, to um, moralize and kind of tell the story of the land. Like you, you just gave that little piece of Paul Bunyan was this guy that helped settle this, you know, wild right, land, that's the story, which yeah. is a, which is from, you know, it's this kind of a European perspective and Correct, in a yeah. little while, we're going to talk um, in 
later on we're going to hear from some from folks that are working to end the wolf hunt and one of the pieces that i've been working on for a few months just off and on i've been doing collecting some little stories and things is um how people's stories inform their attitudes about things like the wolf hunt now i'm from you know a generally european extraction and i grew up with uh the you know the the big bad wolf and and all these mm -hmm. things and but i mean uh it's also you know the wolf is considered sacred and and uh is a brother considered a brother to um many people around this area and actually in this interview they go into you know people from the wolf clan um feel like they they say that um people in the wolf clan feel like they are themselves being attacked when they hear yeah. about a wolf attack and um you grew up around this this area and mm -hmm. i'm just wondering what you've been hearing about people's attitudes towards um the wolf hunt and where you think it's going yeah well you mentioned the uh, the big bad wolf and 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 um you know, it's funny because you look at Peter and the wolf, and and these old wolf fairy tales or uh, you know tall tales or legends that we get as kids. If you grew up, you know the way I did with those old story books, and they have a very European vibe to them. They're they're actually in Europe uh, quite often, and mm -hmm. and I don't know, um, you know, how or that that origin of the story started in Europe, but it was certainly carried over by the immigrants who came here. And um, this idea that the wolf is the enemy or this thing to fear. And I guess I was raised that way, too. Uh, and, and you still see a lot of it. Um, it's kind of funny how some people just have this attitude of, like, they see a wolf and they're immediately frightened. Now, I've seen a number of wolves. I've encountered, I live in the woods, you know, so you encounter wolves even. And you, there's something... Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I used to live in Hibbing, and then I moved out to the woods. Um, and and we hear wolves, and we see tracks, and we actually see wolves time to time. And my attitudes have definitely changed since I moved and live among uh, among the wolves. You know, so to speak. Uh, they they don't encroach on people if they can help it, and. There's an otherworldly kind of vibe that come out of wolves when you hear those, that early morning howling, and it's it's yeah, it's a little scary, but it's it's also um, powerful. You know, it's very interesting. So, uh, you know, the attitudes about wolves are the bad guy. Um, they come from one of two things. They come from um, the idea that the wolves are these scary enemies uh, that come down through the European heritage. That's that's you know a majority of the population uh, uh has or they come from these farmers who have very real problems with wolves killing their livestock you know which is a which is a specific matter right and they 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 get upset about wolves cuz you know there's that very specific problem or anyone who's ever lost a dog to a wolf or something like that you know and and they have a story to tell that's very bad about wolves and so you, you, you see it, almost a reflexive attitude about, like, the wolf hunt story, for example, of, of people who, you know, have that story pre preeminent in their mind. They're, they don't care. They think the wolf hunt is great, and and some people like the challenge of, of hunting something that doesn't uh, make it easy for you or whatever. And, um, you know, well, my own personal attitude is I, I don't know... You know, up in especially up here, like uh, the Iron Range and North, or even your area and North. I, I don't know what what we're so scared of. We need to hunt wolves, and what to do with a wolf if you hunt it, and it doesn't seem to fit into the game category to me. I mean, it just seems unnecessary, and but that's my personal opinion. But um, uh, you know, it, it, the the more you explore your attitudes about wolves. Um, you know, I think that your attitude might change about it a little bit, and particularly considering the, you know, that there are a number of people who hold the wolf in in in, in very high regard socially. You know, as part of a as part of a cultural understanding of the oh, area, like a you know? like a non like not like non-native or non-traditional people who just think wolves are 
uh, you know, well, sort of yeah, symbol- that, emblematic to, na- to Native peoples, but also to um, but but sure to that too. I mean, I, I you know I get excited when I see a wolf, um, especially at a distance. You know, when it's in its place <laughs> and when I'm in mine. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I get I think it's cool. I and I get like, just like a bear. I don't want to be two feet from a bear. You know. Um, but I'm glad to know the bears are out there. You know, that's that's an that's an attitude I've picked up just in moving out to the woods and understanding that everything has its place. You know, um, and, and so uh, you know, this idea of hunting wolves is is really the, the biggest driver of it is people who are concerned about overpopulation of wolf who and livestock and and I think practically there's a much there'd be a compromise available somewhere where we we are uh, we, we let people who need to protect, you know, their livestock, do what they have to do. But, but this idea of going out and hunting wolves, I, you know, I don't personally understand it. I, I guess other people have a different attitude, and certainly the state law currently allows it. And so, you know, there it is. But, um, you know, it's, uh, as far as the attitudes around the area, yeah, a, hunt, a lot of hunt, diehard hunters are really excited about it. Um, but on the other hand, I know a lot of deer hunters who don't have any interest in hunting wolves and they don't really know why people are you know so it's mixed you know even among hunters and people who don't have that you know special personal tie to the wolves um uh, there's still a lot of people who are you know indifferent about hunting wolves and you know again you know why are you doing it there's you need to have a reason i think we're talking with uh aaron brown he's uh He's a teacher. He's a uh, author, uh, amateur historian. He's a dad. He uh, has the uh, Minnesota Brown blog, which is kind of a contemporary take on uh, northern Minnesota, particularly the Iron Range. And mm-hmm. I, we spent all this time, Aaron, and I apologize. I haven't given you a chance to talk about your really big thing, which is coming up, which is your <laughs> radio variety show. So please talk about the variety show and kind of the genesis of it. And um, actually, I got to say something about the Genesis. You may not know this, but I was mentored by Scott Hall, who you know from from KAXE. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, Scott and I, when I was there for a brief period of time, uh, really talked a lot about how to do theater, how to do drama, and how to do. We even, you know, laid out some sketches of a possible. Um, um, variety show at Iron... Is it even called Iron World anymore? But anyway, the it, Iron... It, it has a new name, but people, of course, being in the range, still call it what's, Iron What's World. it called yeah. now? It's called the Minnesota Discovery Center. And yeah. when I was there, it was the... When I was a kid, it was the... It was the or younger, it was the uh, Iron Range Interpretive Center or something like that. But right, anyway, right. so uh, this... When I heard that this show was happening, and I guess it's been a couple of years you've been doing them now, I thought, oh, they figured out how to do it. So what is it? <laughs> Well, it, it, it is, I mean, the simplest way to describe it is a, as a traditional radio variety show. That's the format. Uh, we include comedy, live music, and uh, interviews and storytelling, you know, and it's all jumbled together in a fashion that we think makes sense. And uh, that's what the Great Northern Radio Show is. The things that make our show a little different and that fit with the mission of, you know, you talk about community radio and and, and doing things with the community in mind. Um, we're, we've done all our shows in northern Minnesota. Um, we do a show, we've net, we, we travel, we always do the show in a different place. And we go to a town, and we consciously try to include that town or the area around that town uh, and the people there as a, as a key element of the show. In other words, we don't have recurring bits. We don't have, um, we have a small core group of people, my, m- myself, uh, my, my, uh, my producer, a couple of producers, and, and our piano player, and a couple others. And then everybody else is filled in out of an uh, increasingly large group of actors from northern Minnesota and musicians. Uh, and we, we fill out a show and make it special for each place we go. And um, it's a, a you know a fast moving. We try to keep it lively. We try to make it, of course, funny and relevant and uh, and, and and contemporary. You know, we we try to um, 
do what variety shows used to do, which you don't see as much in programming these days. Everything is such with the internet and and even public radio is everything's such a niche market. You know, every show is trying to find a niche where a, a certain number of people will love it because it's so can, perfect for them. I can I can hear that show, Aaron, when I'm listening to, and I am a huge public radio and a huge. Um, community radio and just uh, you know local stuff but i can feel that i can feel when they're stretching it's like they are they somebody wrote this story with a demographic in mind that is not uh-huh. me or even if it is me i don't want it to be me and yeah. it bothers me so anyway yeah. i always hate because i'm a public radio guy and i know that i a great part of me fits in that demographic they're shooting for but i'm starting to realize that this programming that i am enjoying is written and done in such a way that I know that I'm being catered to in a strange way. Oh. Um, so anyway, what this, what this show does is we try to make it a true variety show where if, if, if you want to bring your grandma and grandpa, if you want to bring your kids, if you want to bring your hipster cousin, if you want to bring your sarcastic teenage daughter, no matter what person walks in the door, we're trying to make a show that has a broad appeal, and the connection is where we are and, and you know, what's going on in the world. And, and no, it's not a topical show, but we, we try to include, like, it's more of a cultural show, you know. We're trying to reflect the culture of northern Minnesota and its many facets uh, and, and trying to represent that in the places we go. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it sounds, very, it sounds like you're taking your medicine the way I'm describing it. No, I, it doesn't. I, it's not, well, to me, to me it doesn't. Yeah, okay, good. But, well, but, uh, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a fun show. We're, we're, we, we keep it um, light and funny and, and, and moving, and there's always a lot of different things. You know, we, we have um, this upcoming show, June 29th at the Reif Center in Grand Rapids, is um, we have a couple of, um, you know, uh, well-traveled state, Acts, uh, actual Wolf. Uh, speaking oh, really? Of wolf. Yeah, actual Wolf and his band are in the show. Okay. Uh, and of course, they're pretty well known in Duluth and yeah. Minneapolis. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, Eric Pollard is from Grand Rapids. That's part of the reason he's there. And um, and then um, the Roll Family Singers, which is another pretty well known jug band from uh, Twin Cities area, and and they've traveled about and they do a lot of festivals and events, and they're. Uh, I believe the world champion, past world champion jug band, and so they're mixed in together. Though they have a different style. We got some um, young up and coming talent. We've got uh, uh, you know Sam Miltich and and Mary Laplante, a couple of local um, musicians up there who have quite a name for themselves in jazz and fiddling. And anyway, they're mixed in. They're mixed into this this whole thing. And we have local actors and and a couple of uh, people. And then what I do is I go show to show and I. I start to realize you know who who has what talent and sometimes I'll bring back a talent from another town and kind of introduce them to a new town and and the the whole thing is designed to give a vibe of northern minnesota and obviously if you're from northern minnesota I think you're really going to enjoy it but I I think we're getting now after a couple years of doing this to a point where I think the show is I think anybody would enjoy it and you'd learn something about a place and you'd you'd, you'd just enjoy a, a fun show I hope you know, so anyway, that's that's coming up June 29th, uh, five o'clock. Uh, free. It's a free show. It's free. Uh, but I was going to say I can't mention prices, but what? How to? So uh, you can mention free. Yeah, <laughs> I can say free. So it's at the Rife Center, and uh, also so we're, so uh, Aaron Brown. I want to thank you so much for coming on. Please give yeah. give us several ways to contact you to get in touch with you to order your books whatever it is you've been really generous with your time well Thank the you. best way uh to find out all of the crazy things that i'm up to is just to go to minnesotabrown.com it's all one word spelled out uh and i have my contact sheet and if you have any uh, questions or comments i have a contact sheet there and um you can also find out about the radio show and the book and and everything else yeah aaron Thanks. Let's do it again. This was really fun. Let's, I appreciate yeah, let's, it. Yeah, let's do that. Thanks, JP. It's nice to talk to you uh, instead of tweeting you for a yeah, change. Yeah, t- talking in real life. So Aaron uh, Aaron Brown, uh, cultural clinic critic, uh, or maybe you'll be our Iron Range representative or something like yeah, that. Well, but, that's, that's, uh, I, do, I do a lot of that. <laughs> but uh, uh, So the uh, radio show is coming up June 29th, and thank you uh-huh. for helping us review uh, Axe Giant, the, uh, the Wrath.